Okay, let's rock. Um, welcome everybody to the uh, uh, Do Nothing Project. I'm Jeff. This is my beloved partner, Sarah, and uh, her belly. So there's a third person here. Very unformed human, still rather unformed, but mostly formed, like basically two, one month, one and a half months away. They can pretty much pop out and meditate right now, but they're, they just need to be cooked a little longer. They need to be cooked a little longer. Uh, so Do Nothing Project, basically it's our room, uh, virtual sangha. So wherever you guys come, wherever you are, anybody can just tune in and we meditate together and might explore a particular question or check out a different aspect of practice. Um, I just got back about two hours ago, actually, from uh, teaching a teen retreat, which was amazing. Um, it's kind of hard to explain how uh, poignant it is. You know, you're uh, working with these teenagers and they're, they have all this armor on, they're really guarded at first, not all of them, uh, but they basically don't really know, they never, they don't really know how to be themselves with their peers because the, I mean, maybe with some, but the message they a lot of them get is that you gotta be a certain way or uh, you, this is what cool looks like or this is what this looks like and it's this, so although we do a lot of meditation, really it's about this continual reinforcement of creating a super safe container where teens can just sort of, you know, be themselves and and however they are, they're just being seen and accepted for that particular weird permutation of teenager. And by the end, they just all, you know, their hearts are open, almost all of them. Um, and, you know, they have a technique and you're kind of catching them at this point in their life where you could just see that they could go one way and they just go, and they're just so open to it still because they haven't got all that armoring, the layers of armor on that adults do. And so I'm feeling really uh, psyched about that. It was really beautiful. And then there's also this point there's always like, you know, maybe one or so or two who just are suffering so bad and they just can't, we can't really reach them. And, but, uh, you know, so part of it as when you're there as a teacher is just kind of knowing what you can do. And it's very cool. Anyway, uh, happy to have you guys here. Uh, so, I was inspired in this meditation. I think we're going to do a, a, a pretty straightforward, um, yeah, a pretty straightforward kind of practice we've been doing lately where I'll just kind of set us up and we'll, um, uh, I'll kind of invite it, invite you to kind of to a more open awareness, rest as awareness practice, or within that, if you like, I'll offer some prompts for just kind of lightly being with an object. Uh, but really, you know, in my mind, this kind of a simple practice is, just what the doctor or for me and I think for a lot of people it's not strivey it's not trying to uh, get it right or like or be super hardcore about developing the concentration or it's you know the more restful the awareness is the less um imprints or interference that you create in consciousness you know this is the thing with straining really hard in a meditation practice is you basically create this kind of feedback uh where you can actually end up if you're straining super hard, just making yourself more stressed, which is completely <laughs> counterintuitive uh, and counterproductive to the whole enterprise of the meditation. Um, so, but one thing I thought I'd do that was a little different off the top, just inspired by my co-teacher. So uh, there were four teachers on this retreat and one of them is um, Lama Rod, this guy Rod Owens, who's like a teacher I absolutely love. He's a co-author of a great book called Radical Dharma, which Sarah loved too. Um, Rod is like a phenomenal human being. I highly recommend you check him out. I don't think he has a lot of guided meditations, but I really see him as sort of like one of the people really at the cutting edge of thinking about meditation and how to integrate it into what's happening in the world. And for him, he is a deeply awake guy. So he understands that perspective, but he's very interested in basically honoring and making, like there's no permutation of being a human being that he can't find compassion for. And, it's, and he has this absolute moral compass too as part of his teachings. And, and I think part of it comes from, he, his lineage is Vajrayana. So he's trained in a kind of Tibetan Vajrayana tradition. And at the beginning of every meditation for him, he connects first to a feeling of gratitude. And then he kind of reminds himself, why am I meditating? And then who am I meditating for? And he asks that question of himself, just like, and it's not just for himself. And I find this to be very, I was doing this with when Ra would guide a meditation, I would do this and I found it to be super powerful because I know who I'm meditating for now. 
especially now, um, not just Sarah and my community, my friends, but now that I'm going to be a dad, I'm like, oh man, I do not want to bring crazy into my kid's life. Like I don't want my mental health struggles to be passed on. So it's just to be able to connect to that intention of why, why am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? It really creates a kind of motivation and a particular energy in the practice. So I'm going to guide us in that off the start. So you don't have, if this doesn't sound like your cup of tea, you don't, you can kind of skip that part, but it'll be a kind of an invitation on the top at the top just to, um, uh, answer those questions really, you know, connect in maybe if there is a feeling of gratitude you can connect to about just being able to do this practice. That's great. And then just asking yourself, well, you know, why am I meditating? I'm really asking it. Like, why am I, um, clarifying that and who am I doing it for? And then we'll go into our practice. So, um, I'm just going to pull down this blind here. <clears throat> Oh, by the way, this is the new IB Me. Every year they give out a new shirt. So uh, the whole world in your heart. This is kind of weird horror looking heart with a, it's actually a world with like nature on it, but made to look like a heart, but it's kind of like freaking revolting and terrifying. Anyway. Um, oh yeah, cool. Hey, Susan. Uh, okay, so let's, let's meditate. Um, We'll do about 25 minutes and uh, then come back and check in with everybody. So um, we got uh, 8.09, so go to about uh, 8.34. Ready, good? I think it's a nice shirt. Okay, so as always with the Do Nothing Project, you got your own technique and you're here for the community largely, then absolutely welcome to kind of kick that into gear. But if you want to follow along with me, we will start the way I mentioned. So just here, as we're getting settled in, maybe a couple breaths, stretching up the spine on the inhale, you know, shoulders back, opening the chest and heart, letting the belly be soft. And on the exhale, that's the downward motion, the, the settling and the relaxing. And a good long out breath can softening the forehead, to the cheeks, the jaw, the shoulders and feel really nice. So just as a little experiment here, just checking it off the top. First of all, you know, as Rod would say, it's like seeing if you can connect to you know, it's a mild feeling of gratitude, you know, grateful for this community practice for the nice weather today. If it was nice weather, whatever people in your life, just because that kind of primes kind of opens things up a little bit here at the start. You know, you say it opens a heart. And then as you do this, you can ask this question, you know, what am I meditating for? Why am I doing this? Good to be clear about our intentions. Is it to be more present, less reactive, you know, more focused? Maybe it's to improve your golf game. It could be anything. Just kind of checking in with that. And then the next kind of question you can ask yourself is, who are you meditating for? Of course, saying yourself is absolutely legit. But who else? And by the way, if you didn't say yourself, <laughs> you should, because you need it too. But who else? Who else in your life? And how do you want to be for them? How could the practice support you so you're you can show up for them more? So this kind of puts our head on right here at the very beginning. We put some energy into the practice. Helps us stay committed. So I'd say the basic instruction here is, you know, there are entire schools of meditation that are all about just sitting and being. 
that simple act is radical in our culture. To not have to do anything. To sit in your awareness, kind of like you're just enjoying existence. And I like to do this with a cue around awareness. I like to just sort of notice my awareness and I just let, let my awareness sort of like rest as awareness. So settling back in the awareness itself. And sounds come and go. There's a sense of my body all through and underneath me. A sense of Sarah next to me. But it's all kind of happening in, in awareness. And your know, attention goes out to grab onto an object to notice something and kind of get into it. Awareness is more spread out. It's more the the whole thing, including the periphery. It doesn't go anywhere. It's like things come to it. And that's a place you can stay if it feels comfortable. Okay, good. So, like I said, that might be where you want to stay, just having this open awareness practice. Present, relaxed. Part of that practice is knowing that there's nowhere to go, nothing to gain, nothing to add. That the simplicity of, of that stance is really healing, nurturing. But for some people, I like to just have a an anchor they pay attention to that kind of helps them stay more on track. And that's totally fine. You can be lightly aware of the sensation of the breath or lightly aware of sounds, you know, feeling in the hands, pretty much anything. And that can kind of be like a tether that just keeps you in place. You're still aware maybe of the periphery awareness, but you've got this piece in the foreground that you're committing to. Something simple, you know, ordinary, but there's something really, really beautiful in that. And kind of being with the simplicity of that object, that breath, that sensation. You can try that too, but that works for you.
through it. So it's kind of settling happens here. Just letting everything settle. You know, there might be thoughts going on in the background. Not a problem. The idea is just not to deliberately feed them. So if you find yourself sort of just automatically going along with the thinking or even if it's kind of barely in your awareness, you sort of notice and come back. So either the sensation of the breath or whatever you're paying attention to or just to this more open, available, expansive awareness. Resting with this uh, understanding that there are no problems in this moment. And that's the, the attitude of allowing everything to be here when we practice this. So resting as awareness. Just notice if there's any you know, holding any tension in your forehead in any way, not straining a bit or efforting. Uh, a nice out, out breath, you can kind of let that go maybe or soften the shoulders. Really dropping back, dropping back into awareness, letting the body be open.
if it's a resting in this open awareness or in the body with some object or anchor in the foreground, or this one base you come back to. Just this equipose in the body is easygoingness. You know, not letting yourself react to stuff. You notice your thinking, it's not feeding it. Kind of be in the background. You've got uncomfortable body sensations, not straining against them or fighting with them, but just how it can be in the background. Another the saying there's a kind of effortlessness in awareness. You don't have to work to know something, be aware of something. It's just there in awareness. There's a way of sort of shifting our identification and know ourselves as that the slippery effortlessness, just the knowing itself, which is so both thin and deep, can't be touched by the objects that come up in it. The knowing itself is wider, deeper. And we can rest as that. I'm deliberately leaning back into that.
the empowering art of doing not nothing, then at least very little, the most massively very little, and defiantly enjoying it, being up the thumb, the productivity, and down the thumb, up the finger, enjoying, just resting, resting in awareness, maybe noticing the breath, maybe noticing sounds. Looking back in your own open field of experience and being not only okay with that, but deciding to enjoy it. Incredibly rebellious act. Okay, good. So I'm almost finished here. Just a couple minutes left, but then we'll finish up with another bit of a gratitude hit. We'll start the meditation. Just connecting a little bit to maybe what you're grateful for and also to who you're practicing for. And bringing those people back into your mind. You include yourself. You might include uh, an institution necessarily a person situation just saying thank you or uh, maybe you can kind of feeling a gratitude a little bit to those things those people and i only want to do is i imagine that i breathe in and kind of breathing in this sense of connection to those things breathing into my heart saying thank you and breathing out sort of sending out and caring you know, you can expand the web and think of all the people who are grateful for you for showing up in the way you do. Just smiling and kind of feeling yourself connected. That's our little gratitude practice. Stoking that engine. I'm grateful for this community. They were all connected. Oh. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks for meditating. 
to turn this light on or is this going to be too much? Mm, oh, no, too much. Good to see with you guys. Let's see. Can I remember to open my questions? Yeah, no, I didn't because I just got back. Yeah, so maybe just on the uh, expand the tip about um, I was talking about Rod and uh, he has this crazy meditation he does where first of all, anytime he has a challenge in meditation Okay, nice to meet you, Elaine Chris, awesome, everybody So uh, every, every time uh, he has any kind of challenge in meditation, not only does he say it's okay kind of soothing himself. He says, oh, it's okay. And he says, you're not alone. Uh, kind of this is the mantra he repeats to himself, which I do too. It's like, okay, it's okay. And then it's, you're not alone. You know, you this thing is, this challenge is happening. Uh, but other people have challenges too. And maybe it's configured slightly differently, but when we get into the weird comparison mind of our own challenge being more than someone else's challenges, in the moment we just connect this universal understanding that like, this is the human situation. Everyone's got challenges. And when you do that, it's okay. I'm not alone. It makes you feel, it gives you more energy for the practice. But then the final move he does, which is like crazy uh, and beautiful, he does, it's a kind of based on a, I think what they call Tong Len. This is where you're basically eating other people's pain. As he says, I want to have this challenge. I want to go through this so someone else doesn't have to. So not only are you welcoming the challenge, you're you're connecting to the energy of like actually you're doing this so that someone else doesn't have to do it uh and that's very empowering and motivating it's like okay actually there's a reason for this and i actually believe that's true you know in the sense that in the in the working through of this challenge like in the capacity developed in the working through that challenge you are going to have more presence and you'll be able to be more there for somebody else when they have their challenge whatever that is so it's true in a way. When we when we practice with that intention or that mindset, you know, we're connecting to this much bigger kind of what they would call in Buddhism this bodhisattva vow. This, but it, it gives a lot of energy and, and strength into the practice. But I think it's really beautiful and it's, it's a nice add-on to the more dry, straight up awareness, whether it's in a non-dual or in a vipassana type tradition. Uh, that's what we got here. Uh, Oh, interesting. So Lily's saying that she uh, used the prompt, who are you med meditating for throughout the practice? That's a great idea. I hadn't thought of that. Just continue priming that pump. Continue reminder. You know, it's sort of like having a low-level loving-kindness practice going on. Like, just kind of remember that person and keep, keeps you there. Um, um, yeah. Awesome, guys. Really grateful for this community. My wife's there to sit with me. Um, yeah, I think next week I actually won't, I'll be able to, I'll have had more time. So I might go, I'll, I'll go through the questions and I'll answer a couple questions next week unless you guys have something you want to put down right here. Um, yeah. Thanks guys. I'm grateful for this little burgeoning community as well. It's nice to see you all every week. And I'm going to keep the, I'm going to keep the mic, get the thumbs up on the mic with the new edition. Hopefully it sounds okay. This it's like this giant radio quality. This is our new member of the family. Uh, but don't worry, I'll still keep the low tech, tech, no, low technological we don't overhead going on. Low tech, the pink couch, all the great low tech stuff we have. Okay, so we got a couple questions here. Uh, one is um, struggle with needing to move frequently sometimes. How can I deal with that? Okay, super common. Um, basically the answer, there's a couple ways to answer that. One is, um, uh, one is if you have to move once in a while, that's okay. It's not a big deal. Um, you don't want to hurt your body, but what I would mainly say is that the urge to move itself is a really great thing to, to meditate on. And that's what they would do in a traditional, more traditional Vipassana type practice or insight practice. It's like, okay, I feel like I need to move. But really, everything that's just happened to you is sensations. 
and some sensations are urgent, some are less urgent. If you can just kind of zero in on, try to find where the sensation of needing to move is coming from. Let's say it's coming from, it may all be coming from the discomfort in the foot or in the leg or something, but it's also, I almost guarantee it's also coming from a kind of low level agitation in the body because I am that same person. And I can just go in there and go, okay, like pretend I'm getting, I'm like a chipmunk and I'm checking out where the, the epicenter of the agitation is. And I'm just like, and I just start to notice that as an object and be like, you're allowed to be here. And open to that, and what you do is you take the, the intensity out of the sensation, the urgency out of it, that can happen. I mean, it can sometimes, it's, it's kind of like a bell-shaped curve. Sometimes it gets more intense, but if you stay with it, it can pass. And it's a good thing to kind of work with. And if it feels really intense, you can kind of pendulate into it. So you notice it for a bit, and then you go back to your main thing, and you go back to noticing it for a bit. But the main thing is to accept that you're having that sensation by first noticing where it is, and then it becomes much less um, influential. Uh, and that's a process. I mean, that's sort of the process you're learning throughout your meditation career, how to work with that stuff. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, if your leg falls asleep, it, you're probably not going to lose your leg to gangrene in 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Well, that's the thing. So it's just discomfort. So, so you, it, the skill of learning how to work with discomfort is like the most important skill you can pretty much learn in your life because... It's going to happen. Um, okay, so Susan's saying there was a static throughout the session. Any, anyone else hear that? Well, we can problem solve that in the audio. Lily, how to handle strong emotion in the moment. Uh, uh, before you have time to process it, you need to respond, but don't want to react. With strong emotion, for example, I'm in a conversation with someone, and they say something that makes me angry. If I had a day to process it, I'd respond in a healthier way. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, that's this is about how to be... This is about how to have equanimity in the moment when you're in life as opposed to in a meditation, although it's the same principle. Uh, you're bopping around in life, and somebody says something that super triggers you and pisses you off, and your normal response is to be like, ah, attack or run away or whatever your pattern is. Uh, but that's why we have a regular practice. The more you have a regular practice where you're just practicing general equanimity, general openness, it's like it happens and you've got more space just naturally to respond. Um, and it's, it's kind of like that and then noticing your own triggers, noticing what the experience of being triggered is really like, where does it, sim similar to what I talked about the fidgeting, where does it start? And if you can just kind of like catch it as it's beginning, you know, someone says something to you, you have a big response, you're going to have a big response. It's like up it comes and you just sort of, you're trying to track the sensation itself. Like instead of being focused on what's going on in front of you, I just sort of shift my attention to what's coming up in here and I just try to ride it out. And often I still end up saying something stupid or I might catch it late. And then it's about being compassionate with yourself because you're just trying to do the best you can. Um, but it's all about, that's all about riding the wave. You know, I have that, that meditation in Dan, the book, in Dan and my book, uh, Surf the Urge. It's all about kind of how to do that, but it's, it's hard. You know, it's sort of like a, it's a right, it's part of a training. There's no trick because you're being, it's surprising you in the moment. So you're not in a way you're just creating the habit of being ready to deal with all intensities uh, it's there's there's you know it's and they would say you, you're creating the habit of kind of guarding the sense gates having a kind of a, an awareness of knowing when what shit's going on and what's happening and where your state's at and what's coming in what's coming out when you're truly taken by surprise it's because you've kind of gone on on automatic in your life so this having a certain amount of awareness and awareness goes on automatic at a certain point in the practice you just always have this sense of being more aware it's hard for me to be surprised by a shock thing in the foreground, although I still will lose it. Because it, whatever the intensity is, at some point you're going to reach your edge and it goes past your capacity to be cool with it. And then you're in overwhelm and in reactivity. And, and then you're like, oh, you come back later full of shame because you have to look at it. Um, so that's my answer to that. Um, uh, hopefully that answered that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, I guess... Uh, it's hard. It's hard answering questions on the things. I don't know if I've answered it or not, and people keep coming back. But um, yeah, so the name of the book and the author that I mentioned at the beginning was Radical Dharma, and it's written by three people: uh, Angel Kyoto Williams, um, Lama Rod Owens, and what's the name of the third? Uh, I forget the name of the third author. But anyway, amazing book. Highly, highly recommended. Rod is black and queer and he just lays it down and it's just um i can't say enough good stuff about this book it's okay sweet uh, well, 
Okay, guys. Awesome to hang out. See you next week. And to be continued. <laughs>